Welcome back, everybody, to another episode. I believe this is the 12th episode of How to Win at Chess. It's a series where I play 10-minute games against my subscribers. I go up the rating ladder, walking you through all phases of the game. In recent episodes, I've dropped secret codes to my opening courses, uh, and that will pop up at some point in the video. It will really only be available for the first few days because ultimately it will run out. Today, we've got one of our most intense episodes ever in this series. I'm playing from 1300 to 2100, so normally, I will throw in a game against an 8, 9, 8 900, even 1,000 rated player. Uh, but today I'm just going to play openings that I usually am recommending and then kind of walk you through the games and, uh, well, how to study openings, really. That's just, that's what it's all about. So d4, knight f6. Uh, I do have a course on the London, but against knight f6 in particular, we can play bishop g5. And of course, I do have a video on this. This is called the Trumpowski attack. The idea of the Trumpowski is to take a Nimso player, a King's Indian player, Grunfeld player, Benko, Gambit, and Benoni player, all out of their comfort zone. You can already see my very strong opponent, 1350, thinking. Because, right, okay, and now they play this g6 move. The idea of g6 is that you just want to go back to bishop g7 and king's Indian, but now I take. And what I've done here is I've damaged your structure, right? Now I'm going to play e3. So I'm going to rebuild on the dark squares, and I'm going to put my bishop on g2 to control the diagonal. Now, here a King's Indian player is highly uncomfortable because this is really not what a King's Indian position looks like whatsoever. And what white does is by playing knight e2, knight d2, maybe queen d3, b3, c4, will expand and, and really complement this bishop. And because black doesn't get the standard attack of the King's Indian, uh, a lot of players here just don't really know what to do. Uh, they will kind of be all over the place with their gameplay. The best plan for black is to move this pawn up, move this bishop out, and that's kind of intuitive, actually. And then bring this knight to d7, to f6, and to e4, through that pawn. And maybe c6 to close off my bishop. And of course, like, computer always evaluates this as totally equal. But that doesn't really mean much for the average human player. You, you really should be playing openings that are based on uh, practicality, you know? And when you're, when you're 13, 1400 trying to move up the ranks, this is very important. Also... I'm no longer wearing any hoodies uh, because it's extremely hot. There will soon be an air conditioner there if you watch in the next few days on this channel, uh, but it's, it's not currently there now. So I could go c4, takes, and then take this pawn and try to trap the rook. Uh, that is an option. Do I want to do it? There could be bishop d5 there. Sometimes losing this bishop for this rook, even like though you're winning material, isn't actually that great for white. Because this bishop is so strong, and this rook is totally out of the game, and if I trade this bishop, I have a bunch of weaknesses. I've got five pawns on dark squares, and I've traded off my light squared defender. So believe it or not, that's actually very much uh, the case. Like, I would actually rather preserve this bishop. Okay. Now if I play c4, and my opponent takes, what about pawn thrust into the middle? And isn't this bishop getting trapped somehow? It's actually very interesting. This bishop doesn't have a lot of breathing room. I can play c4. Look at this nice example of pawn play. My opponent might think that I'm going for this and just snap take and just be like, well, that's not so bad. My rook is not so trapped anymore. But it's a really peculiar trapping of this bishop in the center. And it shows you how quickly all my pawns from dark squares can mobilize. Okay, opponent chooses not to do that, uh, thankfully, <clears throat> for themselves. I'm going to take. Here's why. Because whatever ends up on that square will be a pawn. If my opponent plays with pawn, pawn. If my opponent plays with bishop, I might take, actually, just to create a target. Then I will play knight c3, knight f4, and queen b3, and we're going to round up that pawn. Maybe. If bishop d5, I can also go back to my original plan of expanding in the center like this. Um, but I think I am going to create this pawn weakness. Now, I know I just said I'm trading off my light squared bishop. I know. But I'm also trading off my opponent's light scored bishop. You understand? In the other situation, my opponent would have maintained this light scored bishop. Now they don't have it. Still, I believe that objectively, the position is probably quite balanced. Uh, but if I just put one more pawn on a dark square, I have completely created a dark squared pawn complex against my opponent's dark squared bishop. And I've got ideas. Okay, well, that move is just... What is that? Okay, I guess my opponent just forgot that I could take this pawn. Uh, that did not have to happen. They could have definitely put up a bigger struggle. Now that I'm up a pawn, it's still, it's still far from over. Uh, this is still very much a position that 13, 1400 
might might not be successful uh, in playing for a win. Do I trade? Do I trade? It's either trade or retreat. Very difficult question. I actually believe I shouldn't trade. Funny enough, I don't think I should trade. Trading kills my knight and activates my opponent's piece. I think they would have... Okay, well, my opponent's just very belligerently going for a trade, but now I'm going to trade on my terms. I'm going to force my opponent to take me. You see? That's the difference. I'm tr making them trade, but improve my position in the process. Whereas the other way, that wouldn't have happened. And by the way, this move has not been played, which shows, number one, unfamiliarity with the opening. Because if you've ever been in a Trumpowski position like this with black, <clears throat> you know you have to play a five. The question is, should I bring all my pawns together? Like, I I'm inclined to take with a knight. Just seems smarter. Uh, B7 is under attack. Maybe B5 will be played. And now we're kind of in that middle endgame phase. Some pieces have been traded, but we have the heavy pieces on the board. Uh, rook C1, Rook D1 uh, is playable. I want to go A4. Uh, I also just have a pass pawn that I can push. I think here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use a pawn break to soften up the queen side even more. Uh, and uh, try to win the A pawn. And then when I can win the A pawn, I'll have two pass pawns. And you see this? That is the sign of a King's Indian player playing against the Trumpowski. Just a little bit of unfamiliarity with the position, and it goes a long way. And I'm curious. Okay, my opponent just seems to be a rapid player. I wish I could do that. I only play Blitz and Bullet. ADHD. Uh, also, laziness. Don't really have to care so much when I play the shorter time controls. Uh, we await a move. Really not too many options. That's the, that's the other thing about just really keeping the only piece the opponent has out of the game is that they really don't have any options. Uh, they probably have to take. I don't really know what else my opponent can do given how solid the structure is. Yes, I have weaknesses, but the difference between having weaknesses and having exploitable weaknesses is massive. Cannot be understated. Can't forget. Sometimes we, we in our head, we're like, oh, that's weak, that's bad. The other situation was weak because... Okay, that's interesting. I guess my opponent is trying to get in here, but again, I want you guys to not see ghosts. That's just a pawn. Like, it does not matter that the queen can get here. It has no backup. It has no backup. Uh, now I can even trade queens. I can trade queens and rooks and just be totally winning. I'm going to definitely go for the queen trade. If we had taken with the knight, we would have ran into serious trouble because we would have pinned our knight to our queen, just so you guys see that. A rook b8 would have been played. That would have been a bad problem. Definitely simplifying here is the way to go. Now, rook b8 is a move. Rook b8 is absolutely a move trying to do the exact same thing. The problem is I've got backup. Yeah, see, now I can take the rook. And now this, this, is, this, this is pretty simple. I just bring it back. I have two extra pawns and... The end game will play itself. I'll put my rook behind the pawn, and I will push my pawn. I can also just push my pawn. Uh, but uh, rook b1, and then of course, since it's also the end game, you can just walk the king. And notice, notice, folks, this is super important. Look at my structure. You see how that thing has survived? It's like it survived the apocalypse. Everything exploded. You come back to the intro scene of the movie. It's still there. I, I don't even have to move it. I can I can play these four pieces for the rest of the game, just to show you how nice this kind of structure is of the Trumpowski when you take against G6 players. It's very nice structure, and it, it'll survive the test of time. Um, and you'll just get very nice, easy, easy positions. And that is one of the recommendations in the D4 course for the white pieces. Uh, let's play B5 as possible. B5, I don't want to lose my pawn. Knight D5 would be nice if I could play E4, but if I can bring my king to the defense of the knight, that would also be nice. Rook c8, I can push. If takes b7, I guess the bishop stops me. But if here, I can always just play rook b3. Uh, should I rush with my pawn to b7 is the question. Let's bring the king. Opponent is also bringing the king. Okay, we're going to have a little king walk here. Uh, I, I might need to break my promise to you all. I was going to win this game with just these four pieces. I don't actually know how feasible that is. I might need to use one of my other pawns. I'm very sorry I lied. <clears throat> but of course this pawn can can march up to b7 uh and then the rook won't be able to move okay king d3 i guess opponent is trying to do some flank pawn stuff here maybe soften up my structure very common flank pawn advance idea to make the opponent take and double their own pawns i won't i won't budge uh, i'm going to continue to just push this over here 
Maybe Rook B7 will be played. If Rook B7 gets played, then yeah, I will have to break my promise to you all and probably just end the game by break. Ah, well then I'm not actually breaking my promise. <laughs> if Rook B7, and then I can I can go. Ah, opponent isn't isn't being very nice. They're gonna take and force me to. All right, I lied. I'm sorry. I I could have also taken, but yeah. Okay, well that bit of counterplay has been thwarted, and now we will focus on the queen side. For black, the most important thing to do was not to lose that b5 pawn. The game was still pretty, pretty holdable. Uh, you would have had to hold it if you brought your rooks to the middle and opened up this. And I kept suggesting things for my opponent, but, but they didn't handle the counterplay phase of the game effectively. And now they're getting squeezed to death in the end game. And that happens. That happens. Uh, just because I might make it look smooth doesn't mean that it's necessarily supposed to be smooth. I mean, ideally you, uh, you know watch the series and watch the games and you go wow that's really simple and try to implement it in, in your own games but chess is a hard game it's it's not it's not super easy to just go and sit down and immediately implement everything it is that you've just seen in a game how many of you have watched videos and then tried to go play and it's not possible <laughs> you just you just can't possibly get it on the board and it ends up being uh impossible to replicate I'm basically trying to kill dead air here, uh, as my opponent is, uh, okay. King c4, are they gonna stop me, king c4? Oh my gosh, am I getting stopped? What is going on here? This pawn's getting, king's getting a bit close. No, you can't stop me, because even if you get to c7, I will check you. I will kick you away from my pawn, and then I will continue to, to advance. Let's go rook b6 check, if king goes to c7, like I said, knight d5. Yep, now king has to go away. And uh, actually, folks, I might not be that much of a liar after all. Because since my knight and rook create this little force field, I can just walk my king and kick out that rook. And it cannot be protected by the bishop. And if it moves, I will just make a queen. That was a nice game. That was a very nice example of how to properly utilize the Trumpowski. Bishop d6, king a6, king a7. Kick out the enemy rook, make a queen, GG, yo. Still no secret code for you, though. I appreciate you making it 12 minutes into the video. No secret code just yet. Also, don't leak the code. You kind of sabotage people's opportunity to, uh, to get it. Also, I'll filter it in the comments. Um... This is the plan. I would like to make this portion of the video more exciting, but unfortunately, we are just implementing the final phase of the game. We almost did it. We almost did it. With the exception of one pawn capture, as forced by my opponent, we just played these four pieces the rest of the game. That was, that was nice. That was a nice way, you know, minimalism. I'm going to make another rook. Of course, it was going to get taken anyway. But now I play king takes b8. And, uh, let's see. Okay, rook f6 is possible. Just take both pawns. I'm letting the next person know that they are going to play. f4 takes. Now, of course, is something I call the cleanup process. And um, here you basically have to not blunder anything. I was almost going to go here, as I said that, to blunder my knight. Rook f5 is fine. My pawn will also protect both of my pieces. And you win the final pawn, you promote something, ideally a queen. But also a rook, as I did in this case. I promoted a rook because it was going to get captured. GG, Derek. Uh, I said everything I had to say, actually, about this opening. Uh, f5 is necessary. Very necessary. Otherwise, white just gets this very aggressive que you know, queen thrust, queen side thrust with c2 to c4. Uh, black really has to play f5 and h5. But that one was relatively clean, I gotta say. Um, 
I doubt that literally. I sometimes I do a big analysis after the game, but that that game was 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 smooth sailing, uh, and I kind of explained all the thought process. Feel free to rewatch if you need to. Uh, this next person was gonna go third, but because they have to go, uh, teenagers gotta sleep. This game I'm gonna play e4. Next person will go e4 e5. Okay, so I've got the Vienna. Also got knight f3, and I've got the Danish Gambit. All of them. I'm gonna go for, for my Vienna. My favorite system. The opening course that I recommended first before any other. e4, e5, knight, c3. And now the Vienna Gambit enabled by this move, knight f6. Now, you cannot take. Okay. Opponent knows the best move, d5. Um, f takes e5 is the main line. Knight takes e4 now. Queen f3. So it's very important that, you know, we, we know what we're doing. Now, knight c3 is one of the main moves. I know that in this position, knight c6 and f5 are better. And after bc3, we are going to see what my opponent plays. The best move is c5. Bishop e7 is a move, but this move allows me to take a big center. And now c5. Okay, so here, bishop d3 is what we play, because we don't want to block in our... And we also don't want to damage our own structure, so we play bishop d3. We're never worried about this. The one thing we need to start a successful kingside attack is a very stable, solid center. Um... And uh, we will get that, like this. This is how you stabilize. You have to know kind of the, the piece configuration in the opening that you're playing. C4, bishop f5 is the point. Now here, some people play g6 because they see that c4 can trap you. Um, okay, I'm gonna castle, because I think that's, that's a good move. And now we've got a bishop aligned, we've got a queen coming in, we've got another bishop, we've got a knight ready to pounce, and we have a rook. So these five pieces, are super important in these Vienna style positions. Some people here uh, take to create some counterplay on this pawn. That is one way to create counterplay. It's not effective at all if you know what you're doing. And other people just kind of try to finish their development. Now, we need to begin the pulling apart process of opponent's position. Step one might be to restate, kind of add an extra layer of of support for the center of the board here. Um, knight f4 is an option to also queen h5 is an option. Queen h5 is a checkmate threat. I mean, I don't really think it can be that bad. Let's do it. Looks like a decent move. Uh, although I might have just blundered because g6 is possible and that enables c4. Oops. Well, that was really stupid. Why did I do that? I knew that that was going to happen. Okay. Let's try to recover from that blunder. Hmm. I don't know why I did that. Folks, why did I do that? I literally just said I needed to prevent g6. In my mind, for some reason, in this position, c4 just was not possible. Like, my mind just didn't even... Maybe I had thought I had moved the knight so I could go back. Weird. That was so strange. Well, I, I tend to record these episodes at 10 at night. I think my ELO performance goes down about two, 300 points. Opponent just has this. I, I, I mean, that's just a free bishop. I'm not lying. That's a free piece. Uh, maybe I can get some compensation, as they call it, in the form of an attack. But uh, I, am <laughs> I am not very confident in that. But uh, maybe. F6 played. Okay, well, F6, actually, the first thing that I'm thinking about uh, is to not even take. I see that. That looks really good. And I, that, that, that is kind of the... That's the whole point. That's the whole point. Anytime you push pawns in front of your king, you got to realize what you're destabilizing and potentially enabling sacrifice. I have to analyze if C4 was just winning a piece. And then in this position, we need to, um, that's how we learn. That's how, like, that, that is how, I know you're watching me make this mistake, but that is how we learn the best, the best game plan at the best moment of our, of our opening. It's that moment of, okay, I've left my course. I should review my own course, frankly. I left my course. Now, what was I supposed to do? Like, what was the right game plan? Not memorizing. I memorized up till here. That's as much as I had memorized, and then I was like, all right, I'll figure it out. You know, if c4, I know I have bishop f5, and then I gotta somehow get my pieces over here. That's the way studying openings works, but 
Bishop g6 is just something that I've seen from experience that I know that you can really, you can really do some damage here to an empty naked king. Um, now, you got to be precise because this doesn't work. That doesn't work at all because the bishop covers, which makes me think knight f4 is smart. Makes me think I should go knight f4. Now, I can throw in this check anytime I want. In fact, if I go up, I'm threatening check and rook g3, which is winning. In fact, that's probably what I should do. The threat is not this. The threat is this check to kick the king back and then this check, and then it's mate. See, the rook lift is super important in these attacks. Fe5 runs into queen h6, not to mention the bishop is hanging. Rook f7 kind of covers the problem? No, it doesn't, because I just do the same thing. Oh, but I guess rook f7, there is this block. Uh-huh. Okay, so maybe rook f7 will delay, but then we go knight f4. And then we hit this very loose bishop. The loose uh, bishop has no, no defense on that square, which, which makes me think the right move here was knight f4 to just hit the bishop. But I got to review, got to review my line. That's how, that's how chess works. I, t I tend to sometimes do goofy stuff against subscribers in these series. Very goofy stuff. Like I, you see me in the, by the end of one of these recordings, I'm like, I'm playing like 1800 level. But that's, that's maybe what makes it more exciting. Sometimes you play to your opposition's level. And I, I'll be very honest with y'all. Like I, uh, I miss some crazy tactics that I, I, I normally wouldn't. I, I want to say it's because I'm trying to give my subscribers chances, but I'm not going to lie. I think I just, I just have brain farts. Probably a medical condition. Brain fart. <clears throat> um, it's kind of a calm moment in the episode. So, uh, you guys have made it this far. What's your favorite show? Let me know in the comments. What do you guys like to watch? I'll go first. I like Family Guy and South Park. Those have been my, my favorite shows since childhood. Not very politically correct shows, but uh, very funny shows. All right. Uh, what's your favorite food? <laughs> I'm just going to keep on passing the time here uh, as we await... A move. Queen d7. That does, that does temporarily prevent one of the things, but I think I also have this move, which threatens that mate and that mate and that mate. I don't think you can stop all three. I've got three mates. Bishop d8 stops all three. It stops queen g7, and then if I go here, they can block. But then I'm going to play knight f4 or bishop h6. That's the other thing. I've got, I've got, I've got a lot of pieces here. You guys like to ask me when to sacrifice when you have more attacking pieces than they have defenders. This is a defender of a square, but it's hardly a defender of a king. I mean, these pieces are standing around, but there's a lot of empty... Wow! Now, I'm not recording this live, so this person couldn't have heard me. Oh, wait, that doesn't stop mate at all, because queen h6, this move stopped guarding the, the rook. So, queen h6, here I can just take the rook. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, this was a very, very... Desperate position already for the opponent. Wow, I didn't even... Again, I'd like to sit here and pretend I, I had that planned. I would be lying. When the bishop goes to g8, I can play this very nasty move. And bishop g7 smothering the king to death. Oh my god. Ow. Ow, ow, ow. Queen f7, bishop g7. Ow, ow, ow. Rook h3. Ow. King g6, knight of... Oh, ah. Blech. Nasty, nasty stuff that's going on here. Queen f7 is still the best move, I think. I don't see an outright win after queen f... Well, the position's winning after queen f7, but at least it's not, it's not checkmate. Look at that, my opponent's showing some resourcefulness. Um... Hmm... Check. My subscribers in Discord have just realized that I did, in fact, blunder a... Uh, Peace on move 12. I wish they hadn't noticed. I wish I would have snuck that by them. Sadly, they did in fact notice. Do as I say, not as I do. You see me in action like that, hanging a piece on move 12? Okay, only move. 
Uh, check here. Check. I mean, worst comes to worst, you can always bail and just play an endgame. Just take your rook up for bishop position, exchange up with an extra pawn, or two pawns, or three pawns. Exchange up and three extra pawns. And, uh, life goes on, and you slowly outplay your opponent and get a nice win. Rook g7 is coming. Okay, there it is. Defended. We take the bishop next. You don't always need to snap recapture. Another very common error is people just go, oh, I just take. Why? Check is the most forcing move in chess. Now you take on f7 and life is good. I'm going to have to step up or else I'm definitely going to uh, make blunders as this episode progresses. And I'm playing some seriously tough opposition. Rook f1. Is a move I would really like to play. Man, bishop d4 is possible. But I have this kind of nice little trick. Where my bishop guards the knight. That is definitely a nice trick to, to have. The bishop is guarding. This is called x-ray defense. It's when you protect something through something else. And it happens on straightaways or diagonals. Knights, unfortunately, are not privy to such, to such things. But... Uh... And while I'm here, I will go check on some basketball scores. Celtics are beating the Nets. Wow. That is definitely unexpected. I don't know if you guys saw Dallas versus Clippers the first game. That was... That's an awesome... It's a really awesome playoffs. I actually really, really like it this time around. The play-in tournament and everything. I like two sports. Basketball and mixed martial arts. Chess is a game, not a sport. But uh, a lot of people would disagree with that statement. But let's just, that's just, that's just. And, and uh, I know that to perform chess at the highest level, you do need to burn calories and be in good physical shape. And that's probably why I'm not a grandmaster. Rook F8 is coming. We will trade off the rook. And Levy's hair will uh, be conditioned or washed. For the first time in my life. Uh, let's take. Clear out. Sacrifice. This is called simplification. Come on, hair. Come on, hair. Bring it, bring it in, hair. Hair just relentless. No resignation. Okay, it looks like stalemate. It's not. Check. I can make a knight. That'd be kind of cool. This is BM, but it's made on the next move with knight g6. <laughs> There's also rook h7, mate. All right. There's a b-pawn that can move, and it looks like stalemate. Uh, my opponent is writing in Discord rather than resigning. That um... There we go. Okay, uh, but folks, listen. Uh, in this game, I decided to hang a piece. Yeah, that was really stupid. Um, and, uh, f6 obviously was a devastating mistake after bishop takes g6. Uh, it was significantly better, of course, to play c4. And here, I don't know what I would have done. I would have probably gone, like, I mean, I was looking at some crazy ideas where I can sacrifice the rook and play knight g3, knight h5. That certainly doesn't work at all. Um... But man, I mean, instead of queen h5, I really wonder. Yeah, so the first thing that my engine is showing is to go here, which is one of the first moves that I said. It's interesting. It's actually the target is not this. The computer very much likes the plan of bishop e3. And then knight f4, queen g3, and to, to target g7. Not to target h7, but to target g7. So there you go. It's a completely different set of plans and ideas, which targets the opposite pawn to force the pawn to move up and jump in. So for example, like in a perfect world, let's say this happens, you play bishop f5, um, maybe there's a trade, black plays b5, and now you play like, you know, rook f3, knight g3, etc. An attack like that. So, that is how we learn from our openings. We don't blunder pieces. <coughs> Having said that, we recover, and ultimately we, we were able to break through. Okay, now I've got my first game with the black pieces.
e4. <clears throat> I'm gonna play um I'm gonna play d5. But not the Scandinavian defense. I'm gonna play this knight f6 move. This is from my uh Gotham Gambit scores for black. Uh Knight f6. So if black if white plays c4 hanging on to the pot, a lot of people here play knight f3. <clears throat> right on Q. Now we play bishop g4. So we delay recapturing, and we allow our opponent to kind of maybe hang on to the pawn with certain ideas. Queen d5 or knight d5 are both playable. I'm going to play queen d5. Uh, queen takes d5 on the board, and we will castle long, and oftentimes our queen will rotate to f5 or h5. I also think, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time. I think you have watched half an hour of the show. Um, I'm gonna put my queen on... Man, f5 is, uh, is, is slightly better. h5 is also totally reasonable. Because h3 doesn't allow them to take, right? Anyway, um, I think you've watched, and it's fair now to, to tell you the code. And this code will get you 15% off, 50, not 15, 50 off of any solo course you would like as I need to think about whether to play knight c6 or e6. I will go e6 and bishop to d6 to target over here. Um, and that code is win at chess, 1, 2. Win at chess, 1, 2. It's not a terribly exciting code, but it's a code all the same. Now, bishop d6 is a move here, and I can also take... If I take, I get two pawns for my piece, and I've got a lurking attack on the king. But then knight h2 might get played, and then I have bishop d6, and then maybe there's f4, and then maybe there's g5. Bishop d6, on its own, only gets me one pawn, because I would take and here, but it would prevent my opponent from actually... Let's do this. This seems more fun. And now we've gotten two pawns. So, of course, knight h2 here must be played. And it is played. Opponent does, in fact, play it. Now, I really want to play h5. I want to play h5, knight g4. And what that will do is it will launch pad the attack on that side. It'll get me some nice attacking chances. Now, bishop d6 is also playable. But bishop d6, f4 is not something I want to allow. So, I'm going to play h5. With the intention to play knight g4. In positions like this, where your attack is a little bit lagging, and you're, you know, you're, you're not getting that plus two right away, because you need that plus two. You need two more attacking pieces than the defenders. You need to look out for peace trades. So you need to look out for, you know, how can my opponent bring a piece out? Look, bishop b5 check is possible to play queen f3 and trade my queen, but I'm going to play c6. You understand? So I'm going to continue to create threats. Bishop g4 I take. Rook e1 to play bishop f1 is possible, but then I will play bishop to d6, and I hit the knight. Or knight to g4. Whoa, 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 whoa. Does my opponent not realize my plan? Isn't knight, knight g4's game over? Knight g4's game over. What am I missing? Knight g4's game over. I mean, you, didn't take, you just didn't take care of the threat. That's just, that's just game is lost now. Queen g4, queen h2, or even queen f1 is a very flashy mate. That's just game over. Wow. That was an 11 move win. That's the Gotham Gambit's course for black right there. That's the uh that's the patented uh kind of delayed Scandinavian. Yeah, we got to we got to analyze that. My opponent just whoa. I don't know what happened there. I mean, we did everything that we were supposed to. Now here, yeah, this sacrifice is really tricky. I mean, it's it's not an easy sacrifice to deal with. Um there are other situations, for example, where you can do this, which is what I showed. Takes, takes, and now it's just like it's really hard to move. But here white is here, here white is okay. Um now when knight c3 is played in the opening, like I said, objectively the best move according to the engine is queen f5. But and, and that of course is covered. But you will find massive success with these ideas of attacking the king. Because not everybody defends like a computer. And when uh, you do play and keep your queen on f5, then you can just play like this. This is just very standard. You will long castle, and I shrunk my board because I got very excited. 
Okay, let me unshrink my board. This is the technical difficulties of being a creator. Sometimes you just do stupid stuff on the fly by accident. Um, yeah, like this is fine, and, and even this damage to your structure is not terrible. And then you play like bishop d6, castles, and you still can create some sort of attack. Um, but the way it worked out, you know, this very important move, h5. Knight h2, which is what I thought was the best move, turns out to not be the best move. Uh, and so we played this h5 move, and now it's, it's very difficult to defend the position. White has to play like this and try to glue this knight here, and wow. That was a, that was a nice win. I'm very happy with that. Next person, Strayaningen. I believe this is a... I don't know. I actually thought this person might have been from Norway. E4. Now I'm going to go E5. Uh, this is another repertoire that I have. Okay, we're getting hit with the Vienna. We're going to play Bishop C5. Uh, which... And then, and then we're going to play... We can either play D6 or Knight F6 here. We are not going to go copycat. We are not going to go copycat. Uh, I will play Knight F6 to maybe go C6 and D5. That's kind of our, our idea here. White is completely fine here. Black is completely fine here. This is just one way to play chess. Uh, it's move four, so I can't get you a winning position on the fourth move. In the other gambit lines, I can, but not here. C6, D5. And this is, by the way, this is also just a good rule of thumb for anybody bored in symmetrical positions. Uh, you can you can attack with your pawns. You, understand? Like, you, see, how, you see what I'm doing? You can rather than just doing two knights and bishop for the more intermediate players, you are more than welcome to kind of play like this and try to get a bit more aggressive. Now, we're in some sort of gambit territory where I might lose my, my pawn here. Uh, I had this in a previous edition of how to win at chess. I know for a fact I did. Like knight e5 got played and I castled and I just, I sacked some pawns and just got a very big attack. And I might do that here too. Okay, never mind. My opponent is not, not interested in engaging in such matters. Uh, okay, so bishop g4 is something I really like. I like pinning this knight to the queen. Uh, I, I, kinda, I, I just really want to do it. Also just castles is fine maybe. Maybe bringing back the bishop to solidify my center. But I think I'm just going to go bishop g4. To keep developing. h3 is a move. And, um, so for example, if bishop takes f3, queen f3, I'm a little bit under pressure in the center. h3 here, here, I think castling is fine. Uh, also, I would like to jump my knight to the center, but I'm pinned, so maybe I'll play a6 to deal with that. Yeah, bishop h5, g4 is the big question for me. That's the big question, me personally. Am I in trouble? Or can I... Oh my god, am I actually going to sacrifice another piece? Am I that wild? Folks, this might be uh, an episode of sacrifices. You know, normally g4, knight g4 is no good. Because you don't really get anything. But in the case... Oh, in the case of only the queen being the defender, I actually think it's not bad. And the craziest thing is my opponent doesn't have to take. My opponent has this ludicrous move. Knight takes e5. Because I can't take. And I, if I took that way, there would have been this. So see, now the knight is only guarded by the queen. If king g2, the knight is still only guarded by one of the major pieces. So I can play like short castle or queen f6 or f5 and e4 or knight d4. That is a wild game. This is, this is actually... This is not bad. This is not bad. If this bishop was here, this would be terrible. If this bishop was here, we would be in a totally different situation. Uh, can I take this? They take and then I take? Isn't that, isn't that just a better capture chain? If I take on f3 and they take, that's check. If I take, take, take. I'm just winning a piece, no? It's a very common tactic. If I had taken the bishop, take, take, that would have been a fair trade. But now... I'm winning this capture sequence because my opponent needs to take... Yeah, it's a common tactical sequence there. Uh, well, now they can escape with the bishop, but I will escape with my bishop. Or I will take a pawn to go. Sauce on the side. 
and this knight can take this pawn, but not if I can take him with, with the rook. It's really bad news, actually, because this bishop's coming here to glue everything. And that just shows you the benefit of being confrontational early in the game. Uh, now we take, we are two pawns up. Rookie one might happen, but I will stabilize my center with f6 or bishop. Oh no, not there. Definitely not there. Definitely not there. We will lose our center pawn. <clears throat> Next two players are going to be tough. Some of the toughest I've played in the series... 1800, 1900, and uh, I believe the next player is like 1900. And then after that, 21, 2200. I believe the strongest player I've played in How to Win at Chess. So I'm excited. Uh, the game plan once you're up a couple of pawns and you're making it to the end game is to keep everybody solid, initiate a couple of trades. For example, I will play a6, more than happy to make that trade. So probably bishop a4 is going to get played. And uh, keep everybody solid, keep everybody happy. Like, even bishop d4 here is not a terrible move. Bishop b4. Probably just ca uh, just castling. Just be, 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 be simple, yeah? Be simple. Don't do anything crazy. Pawn is under attack. I can make a backwards knight move even at the cost of retreating. It's important to stabilize my center. And we are happy. F6 is good. B5 also isn't ever really that bad of a move. F4. That is a good move. I like that move. If I take, I, I isolate my pawn. So probably I'm just going to defend. Yeah, I think I'll just defend. Just defend. I want, I want my pawns together. Probably taking was also fine. <clears throat> as long as you're not making a horrible mistake. Also, knight F5 in some positions... To go here. This pin is annoying though from the bishop. Hmm. What to do? Man, I really wanna I really wanna trade the knight. It's very it's very annoying. Uh I think I'm gonna sidestep this pin. That's what that's what I'm gonna do and try to just push in the center. And even if the knight comes, I'll play here. Wanna play here as well to try to bring my knight and fork stuff. Looking for forward progress, opportunities for forward progress. Knight g6 as well. See, the problem is that if the bishop had ever taken, it would have been check and it would have slowed me down. Whereas now if the bishop takes the pawn, it's not check and I can continue on and win some material. So, uh, yeah, king h8 is a, it's a, an advanced move. I mean, it's really, it doesn't look like it's really doing anything for the position, but the point is to get out of the way of whatever the heck is going on here. And uh, then... We have the next kind of phase of stuff. Knight f5. Threatens knight e3. Threatens knight h4. It's possible to stop, of course. You can move your king. You can defend the h4 square with one of the rooks. But progress is being made, right? Now knight e3 comes. Opponent saw one of the forks, but not the other. Now we are up a significant amount of material and some pawns. And even at the cost of one of the pawns in the center, we will simplify and we will win. And I will drink some water. Knight d5 will be played because it attacks my bishop. I will go here. Happy to engage in more trades. And we have an endgame where I have three pass pawns. And I have rook versus bishop. Now, the way you would screw this up is by losing your pawns and allowing those pawns to promote. I have no plans to do that. So I will probably now centralize one of my rooks i mean rook before is still kind of annoying and then i have to move my pawns like my advantage is right here so i gotta find a way to not weaken my pawns too much in advance the game is far from over but and it will take a little bit of technique d4 is not a bad move let's put my rook on g5 there are positions you do want to sacrifice the rook to get a bishop and a pawn it, it's a little bit too early to do that because if you do that at the wrong moment you're only a pawn up you're, like, actually not even going to be in a winning endgame. And I'm going to take control of the E-file. I've got control of the G-file. This rook is a bit stuck. Rook trade is just a very easy win. So don't trade rooks if you are losing. I want to bring my king up, but that bishop is stopping me. So maybe I'll bring my king this way. But it's still going to take technique, actually. White is doing a pretty decent job. 
Problem for white is that the second you begin expanding with pawns, my rooks are going to be like, what's up? Can you pay a toll, please? King f7. Yeah, that makes sense to go after my pawn, but I've got reinforcements. f5, rook g4. Once my pawns start confidently going up the board, that is when I can in initiate the rook trade. Like, for instance, on the very next move. Uh, because then, I then my pawns have actually gone far enough, and I will bring my king, and you just cannot stop three pawns. Okay, bishop d5 is smart, so I should protect my weak link. And now I will play h4. And opponent might go here, actually, which is pretty, pretty clever. So rook g4, g5, and you see how we're just very slowly moving everybody forward. g5 is coming very slowly. Slow, slow, slow. Everybody's taking a turn. g4 is coming. Um, I anticipate this to not get hit with a fork, and uh, I have, do I have this trick? h3. And then if rook takes, that's a... F yeah, I do. And if king takes, I have this. And if king up, I have rook e3, right? So g4, and this is game over. You always have these little tactics, these little things, especially when your position is slowly snowballing out of control for the opponent. We take, take. We are a rook up. Uh, you should... And now, there we go. Now the wolf is in the, is in the sheep's pen, if that's even a saying. I have, sometimes I invent sayings as I make my videos. I could have taken that and then come back for this, but I chose to go this way. It's check, king slides over, pawn might go, and um, that's game over. Advance this, advance this, advance this. B3. Rook is also paralyzing everybody. Very rude. No stalemates. This time I will make a queen. Check. Easy, easy, easy. Get them side by side, and now bang, and then bang. Nice! Now, that game was, uh... It's a little bit inspired by the, by the, the, e5, uh, the Black Gambit's course. This is e4, e5, an anti-Vienna system, like with c6. Uh, it's a very dangerous line uh, for, for white to take on e5 here. Like, white really needs to be very brave to go for this position, where they are just down... And I believe that uh, where, where they are up two pawns, but down massively in development. And I had a game, I think, in, a, in, a, in an episode where I took. And that's the point. You take on f2. If king takes, you fork the king and the bishop. And you get this position. And here, it's balanced, but it's very dangerous for white. Because you're not, you're not settled with your development. In the game, my opponent allowed me to get quick, quick, quickly active. And yeah, g4 is too dangerous. It looks like, wow. It looks like the best move after this for white was to play this, which is what I noticed, to not snap take back, which is something that we had. It's a very tactical game. To take, I can't take. If I go here, then here. And actually, white is pretty happy here. All things considered, I mean, I castle and the game goes on. Um, but to take and... Yeah, well, it's just a one-move blunder. But for example, if king g2 had been played to protect the knight, I mean, I just castle and... This is not good for white, this position. It's just not good. I've got all these pawns coming, and I can play f5, e4. And this is the one moment that sacrifice works a charm. It's when, uh... The sacrifice works really well when the knight is only guarded by one heavy piece. Or like a king or a queen. Alright, uh, I've played e4 and d4. I'm gonna play e4. I, I hope I don't get another e5 game. Okay, we have another e5 game. I played Vienna last game. This time I'm going to play knight f3. And this is the Gotham Gambit's course for white. Uh, in there we go bishop c4. And uh, on bishop c5, yeah, knight f6 is, is a thing. We usually... I mean, I can play d4 here or castle. Knight e4 is a move. Uh, Steve Jr. MC. 1800 rapid, 1560 blitz. Uh, and now opponent has played bishop to c5, and we are going for our ultra-aggressive. I love this thing. This Max Lang style, that's what it's called. Uh, kind of Scotch Gambit style. Very, very tough to play this with black if you don't know what you're doing. So at my level, everyone takes with the bishop. At 2600, 2700 blitz, everybody knows that bishop d4 is the best move. Knight d4 and e d4 are very natural moves, both of which are bad. Knight d4 gets hit with knight e5, and you're in serious trouble, because f7 is very tough to guard, and then I go here and pin you, and you're uncomfortable. e d4 is, is, is a move that you play uh, if 
you've just never seen this before. Um, and ED4, I mean, there's even... Okay, so Knight D4 does get played. And now I have to remember my line. And I believe the line is just... I mean, it's... Move one is simple. <laughs> yeah, I don't really need to think too much here. Um, but now, now I need to, I need to remember what I'm supposed to do. Mm, I, like, part of me thinks it's some sacrifice on F7, actually. Part of me thinks it's, it's taking there. I also have some move I can go B4 and force Bishop B6, because B4, of, of course, cannot get taken. Also have Knight D3 to attack the Bishop. Also just have just very, very simple, you know, aggressive bishop developing. If I take and they take and I take and they take and I play a move like, oh, that's it. That's what it must be. Yeah, it must be that. It must be knight f7. Because then I have e5. This must be the whole point. Yep. See, I, I haven't had knight d4 against me in so long that... Uh... I didn't exactly remember what to do, but it's this just immediate punishment of this of this kind of setup. Uh, to go here and then bring the queen out. I also can play c3. So for example, if after the big trade my opponent plays knight d5, I can go c3 and kick the knight out, and there will be a loss of material. Now I could go e5 first, but no, I think we're going to take... This is the rare case... Where giving up two pieces for the rook and pawn is actually good. Because there are positions where it's not good. Because you're just giving up two pieces. But because we have this tactical justification, e5, attacking the knight, and it has nowhere to go, it can't go to these squares. If it lands in the center, it's going to get smothered by pawn tactics. And I mean, the alternative is to go here. And if you go there, your king will never be able to escape. So then the alternative is to go there, and that's also bad. Also bad. I've got bishop e3. I mean, I've just got all, all sorts of different annoying ways to put pressure on you, so. But I have to find... Yeah, so 98 is played. Um, to try to preserve the escape. Uh, bishop e3, knight e6. I have e6 right away. If pawn takes, I have queen to h5 with the fork of this king and bishop, which is just the most ludicrous thing I've ever seen. But of course, knight e6 is still possible. So bishop e3, knight back to e6, yeah? Okay. In that position, I can take on c5. Take. And maybe just play like a queen to the middle or something? I don't know. It's, it's not... Kind of wish it was easier. Oh, I think I got it. I think I know my, my combination. I'm going to go here. Oh, wait, no, that's not clean either. Queen h5 check and bishop g5 looks like it traps the queen. That's what it is. Folks, look at this. This is unbelievable. Look at this. B so I want to go queen h5 here, bishop g5, right? But then bishop back to e7. So how do I get the bishop off of this diagonal? By playing the move b4. Because I know that they can't take. And the bishop would have to drop back. Then I would utilize this check to force the king back to protect the pawn. And then we would win. So it's b4. b4 is the move. b4 is the killing move. Wow. That is very nice. That's a nice kind of example of reciprocal thinking. Like, I wanted to go here, but because the knight is able to come back and protect everything, and I wanted to go here, but because the knight is able to, right? So it actually turns out that it's the queen who's, who's smushed. So the one, the, that way the knight would have been uh, blocking the king. But hold on, now I gotta think, is there like some way for my opponent to play g6 and survive? Like queen h5, g6 here, and knight g... Oh my god. It's not over! It's not over. I mean, I, 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 I saw one idea, but knight c2 is still possible in some lines, if I'm not careful. Chess is a fascinating game. Like, you just get to the end, and bam! Maybe there was a way I could have done that better. Who knows? Maybe bishop e3, trade the bishop, and just expand with the f-pawn would have been smarter. Because I, I kind of just totally ruled this out. Like, I was like, you know, g6, queen, okay, I'm just winning. But this is lurking, and... Okay, did my opponent just forget about this? They may have. 
And okay, you can equal danger me, but I just move my queen. Damn, all that hype. When the queen got trapped. Now there is a move here. There is a move knight e2 check. Danger levels worth more than a queen. Th thinking I will take and you will take, but I will not take. I will just move my king. And if g6, queen h6, or queen g, queen somewhere. Where would I move my queen? Probably to h4. And then if here, I can just take the queen and come back. And then we are winning. And then if the bishop comes to try to get my rook, I just kick out the bishop. Man, it's... Chess is not an easy game. That's why I like these episodes. They're very, they're very intense. I mean, it's 1800 we're talking about here. Like... This person's higher rated than 95% of my, of, of, of my viewers, you know? This is, hopefully you guys are learning stuff here. So we're going to take with a pawn. Uh, you only take if you see an immediate knockout. I don't. So, well, I guess I have, I don't know. Which way do I go? I can also bring you back to e3. I guess knight c2 is lurking, yeah? Knight c2 is lurking, so I probably should go here because knight c2 will run into queen g4 and mate. Yeah, so that's probably the smarter thing to do. I'm also threatening queen d5, kind of. But really the threat is this, which can be stopped with a very simple pawn push. And then I still have to be careful because if the opponent can activate every remaining piece, the game is far from over. Even though I have a rook for a, a bishop, I'm up in exchange. That doesn't mean anything. As you can tell, my rooks are not really partaking in the game. Uh, rooks are much more endgame pieces. The more I trade, the more powerful my, rook, my rooks will become. Just like we saw in the last game. Uh, but bishop h6 keeps the bishop lingering around the king, which is what I need. And then if I can play like, I would love bang, 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 just get rid of the bishop for my passive knight. This is... I just want you all to understand, I am not worried about losing my pawn. I'm worried about losing my rook. I would happily lure this knight in here and let it take my pawn if it meant I can just activate the rest of my pieces. Which might not be clear to the beginner. The beginner might be thinking, I need to stop this. No, that's not the case at all. A pawn in this position means nothing. Because black's king is open, all my pieces need to get out. It's relative value of the pawn. The, knight, the, the, the pawn on c2 means is meaningless. All these pawns are meaningless. The g and h pawns are more meaningful. Okay, opponent decides to go back, but now I have knight d5. And, um... I have some really, like, nasty threats here, maybe with some tactics. Knight f6, queen f6, queen e8. The knight has to come back. That's a little bit too much and too fancy. A queen trade sends me to a winning endgame, uh, but I believe that since I have an attacking position, uh, I will keep my queen on the board. Of course, you can take the queen. If you took the queen in a game here, I would not complain. But... And then maybe I will play knight takes b6 next. I don't know, because that also activates my opponent's rook. There's really no reason for me to do that. c4, c5 is better, probably. Or just, like, bring the rook. And king h1, just like last game, moving the king offline of the center. And then f4, f5. Like, you always have to ask yourself which pawn advancement is necessary. a4, a5 is fine. Oh. Oh, I have a very nasty idea. I can play rook e8. Rook e8 is a very, very mean move. Queen d5 is not possible because of queen g. I mean, if you're pinning yourself like this, only bad things are going to happen. And since your queen is now forced to defend this, that is unstoppable. That is just straight up unstoppable. I mean, you can play bishop g7. I mean, you can play king f8, but then I will play bishop g7. So, uh, yeah, bishop g7. And rook e8 is coming, and, uh, yeah. Wow. All because we played, uh, the, the Gambit's course for white. There you go. Now I gotta analyze that. I gotta analyze that. Was that right? Did I do the right thing? Knight e5. Okay, I did all the right things. Yes. Now, what's the best move here? I'm gonna let the computer think. Alright, so, so it likes both. It likes both ideas that I played. But now it's starting to like b4. Very nice. You see, that is how you transition the opening that you study to the middle game. So it likes b4. And it likes queen h6, queen h5, and uh, it does think that this defense was necessary. Um, and here it's now starting to look for creative ways for black to activate pieces. So d5 en passant and like not even taking back. Yeah, the computer is such a savage. It, it wants me to take all these pawns 
because now you see what I said earlier in my analysis, the more pieces that get activated, the scarier the position becomes. Black is better here. Isn't that nuts? So my plan might have been more practical to go here and then get this position. And I saw all of this, you know, and, it, and, I, and I said this, and actually the computer likes this because here black has less active pieces, which is very instructive. Queen d5 check is not a win because knight e6. But yeah, you would get a position that looks like this where white has just much more activity and black doesn't have as much activity. So that was a, that was a tough game. And okay, opponent didn't react accurately. We managed to get a nice winning position. And now we are playing Mr. Theo, who's 2,400 blitz. This is going to be a very decent game of chess. Now, d4, uh, I'm going to play d5. If c4, I'm going to play the Albin. Knight f6. It's tough to do things against the Albin. When they, I mean, but I'm going to go knight c6. Now, if Theo plays the... Uh, right, so now I'm going to go e5. So now we have kind of a Chigorin. So here, if, if, if c takes d5 is played... Queen d5, it's a Chigorin defense. If d e5, d4, we have an Albin counter gambit. Now we have an Albin counter gambit. So, had my opponent play. Okay, opponent goes g3 right away, which is uh, very much a move. Uh, and now I'm going to play bishop to e6. Knight d2, and I'm going to play... You can play queen d7 here to try to try to do some stuff. That's one of the options. Knight b3 is a little bit slow, but this is one of the most solid ways for white to play. Uh, in the Albin, to just go g3, bishop g2, gambit's course for black. I did say at the beginning of the video I was going to play all my own prep against a very well-prepared opponent who might potentially know it's coming. Uh, you will get a position that, according to the engine, is a little bit worse, but luckily your opponents are not computers. Hopefully they're not. All right, bishop g2, and long castle. Now... We're going to have a bloody game, because White's ideas are to go like this, and my ideas are to go like that. And uh, may the best player win. So, knight e7, knight g6, h5, h4. Uh, and now White should probably play queen a4, b4, b5. And uh, in, many, in many games, I just, I, I launch my h-pawn. And I, in many games, actually, in this position, I've launched my h-pawn. So, maybe I should have even done that there. Sometimes my mouse moves faster than my brain. Okay, there is queen a4. So now there's always this question of whether or not I should play king to b8. Uh, I think for now, this is the best move. Knight g6. It's always a decent move. Because you attack the pawn on e5. b4 is impossible because now I can just take with the bishop. And it's dangerous because the b-file is open, but white would much rather this pawn successfully makes it to b5. So now knight g6 prevents that. Now a lot of people play a3 because they want to play b4. And that's very logical. I cannot actually take on e5. Why? My knight is guarding my a-pawn. So I would need to play king b8 before I took on e5. But, but if I am successful in taking the e-pawn, well, then I'm going to have a decent position. My opponent is clearly hell-bent on me not doing that. And now I have a very important question to look into my soul deeply and ask whether or not I am comfortable taking the pawn on b4 or just playing king b8 and trying to win this pawn back. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to lie to you, I have no interest in losing in spectacular fashion. Taking on b4 is a pawn, but it opens up the b-file for my opponent, and frankly that just looks horrifying. If you also couple that with the fact that this bishop in many positions stares down over here, I'm quite unsatisfied. So now I will allow my opponent to continue to keep the b-file closed. It's very good in chess not to give our opponents what they want because then they will steamroll us, they will take everything. But if I am successful in taking on e5 and playing h5, h4 and in trading the queens, there will be no attack. And by the way, maybe even trading the bishop over there. So knight e5 is always part of the plan. We might get knight e5, knight e5. Maybe f4. f4 is a pretty common idea in some positions. That is always something that we have to be on the lookout for. We might go knight g4 to try to jump the knight into e3. f5 is not scary because we can take. At least it doesn't look scary. Let's pre-move this. Very tense position. Intense episode. What are we at, like 75 minutes? 64 minutes. Actually kind of short. 
Okay, so that plan with f4 is very critical, and I think that, that, that really puts my position to the test. I think right now it's in my best interest to make some trade. The question is which trade? Or do I like reinforce my center? Well, the thing about this is there's en passant, right? But then I can trade queens. I would love a queen trade. Let's begin with this though. If pawn takes, not really scary. Doesn't improve the position at all for white. If bishop takes, I can go offer a trade of knight for bishop. If knight takes, knight takes looks like the best move. Because then the rooks can come. But then maybe, I can, like, then maybe I can put my bishop on c5. Right now I cannot put my bishop on c5 because knight b3 comes. So I like this move. And I re especially like that it prevents my opponent from playing f4. That's the problem, is that if my opponent can, can start taking space on both sides of the board, I'm not going to be very happy. Now I, by the way, can also just begin my own attack. And my attack will arrive. Whereas you see, because my opponent has a queen leading the charge, that's the problem. The queen really cannot lead the charge. It's the pawns. The pawns must lead the charge. And if my pawn arrives on h4, it will take. And then my other pieces will arrive. It's a very difficult decision, actually, which pawn to take with here. If you take with the e pawn, then my d pawn becomes passing. And in end games, now all of a sudden I have a big asset. And you, you kill your bishop. If you kill your bishop, I will immediately trade your bishop. You lose another attacking piece. Not an easy position. Okay, opponent takes with the knight. I did say here I want to play bishop c5, because now knight b3 is no longer possible. And I believe that that is exactly... Well, but bishop c5, maybe there's a rook coming. Ah, chess is so hard. Hmm. Do you think I'm a complete idiot for even going for any of this? If rook d1 is just playable. Maybe h5, h4. Man, what did I just do? Bishop c5, rook d1 is on the way. I do this once, like basically once an episode. I mean, I blundered a piece earlier. But, uh... Yeah, wow. Um, I'm quite disturbed. Let's go bishop h3. I think I need to look for a quick counterplay. Very frustrating. I mean, I basically was just like, okay, I play bishop c5, and I, I just ended my calculation there. It didn't occur to me that after rook d1, I have no way of guarding my pawn, because my queen is in front of my rook. Much like I said the queen leads the charge, the queen cannot lead the defense. That's the problem. That was not smart by me at all. Knight f3 was wrong. But again, it's also important not to tilt. I'm pretty tilted right now. An opponent just takes on d4 and doesn't look back. Right, because, you know, because here. In chess, it's, it's, it's rarely the first mistake that kills you. It's much, much more likely it's the second mistake. So now I'm going to play b6. I'm just going to be pawn down. Um, and, uh, yeah. Maybe I could have played c5. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. Bishop takes... What? If... No, but can't I... What? I think my opponent got excited that they got a better position and just totally... Or maybe not. Maybe my opponent is a genius? What the heck is going on? <laughs> okay, um... I'm up a piece. If I move my queen, then they take, and then they take. If I take the bishop, I also can go bishop here. What if I take? They take my queen, I take back, and then they take. I have a bishop and a rook for a queen. Interesting. Ah, bishop d6 is playable. Uh, they can take with the rook, but that doesn't look very smart. If bishop d6, there is also knight d4. So bishop d6, bishop h3, queen h3, knight d4 to go knight c6. I can come back to e7. 
or knight e5 and actually go aggressive maybe, but that looks a bit much. Um... Damn. If I take this way... No, I mean, I don't want to lose my queen. Probably bishop d6 is required. I'm not even... I'm basically just trying to convince myself this move doesn't lose on the spot. Let's go here. If bishop h3, queen h3. Rook d6 scares me significantly less, and knight d4, I think I just have bishop g2, and I can bring my knight back to counteract the invasion. It's a completely insane position. Um, wow. To offset my nerves, I will go check on basketball once again. The Nets are now beating the Celtics. Wow, in the time that I have recorded this episode, the Nets overcame a halftime deficit and now have like a seven-point lead. I'm also hungry, so... That is also one more thing I'm dealing with. Um, somehow, it feels like my opponent's play decreased. Like, h5, h4... I, I can't tell who's attacking who anymore. Knight e5. Man. I mean, I, I need to just not... If, if, if I can prevent this knight from getting here, which makes me think I probably should just play knight e5 and shut up. Let's just play knight e5. The bishop will stand comfortably on g2. The queen will stand comfortably. Man, but I... I don't know. I feel, I feel bad parting with my horse. I don't want to part with my horse. I want to party with my horse. I don't have a horse. Well, maybe I won't. It's going to be an interesting game to analyze. Very, very high-level game. By my opponent, not by me. I'm just a moron. But, uh... Yeah, I... Listen, uh, boss, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have to do this. Uh, and uh, then I actually have to start my own attack. Probably. Or maybe, do I put you down the middle? What do I do? How do I do this? Let's go here. It's not over. I mean, opponent can continue to create threats. I'm going to play rook e7, rook c7, probably. Also, time is now becoming a factor. It very rarely becomes a factor in these games. Uh, but I don't have a lot of time. The last game of all the Win at Chess episodes is always very intense. So, rook e7 guards everything. I have a rook. My opponent has bishop and two pawns. You trade queens? I still don't actually know who's better in that endgame. Probably black. Okay, they want some battery. I mean, I almost don't care. I don't think I care about losing that pawn. But I, I can't really tell right now. I gotta play a little bit faster, too. So, I think I'll create this little spike. Or maybe, maybe I'll just go h5, h4. This bishop is so strong. Yeah, of course, bishop d5 makes a lot of sense. Uh, f5 to create the spike and not hang any pawns. The good thing is there's no easy there's no easy breakthrough. Of course, there it comes. Of course, there is the attempt at breaking through my position. Very rude by my opponent, of course. Queen a3 is an option. It prevents any pawn from moving. It prevents rook a1. Uh, rook d1. Okay, now I'm going to play h5. I think I need to create counterplay. Rook d3 I was not super afraid of. I guess I can go back. I mean, if my opponent offers me a draw, I, I gotta really consider this draw. I don't want to draw. But... Uh, I might not have much of a choice. Queen e5, a5. And I shouldn't burn all my time thinking about whether or not I want to draw. So let's go back. Maybe I can go queen b4. That's an option to try to sneak in very close to the king. Now my opponent is trying to think if he wants to draw. You see, now we're both... Um, 
Right, he wants to. There you go. Two and a half minutes per player. It's always fun watching when these games get recorded off stream because everybody in the Discord is watching them too. You can see them getting hyped. Bishop f7. Uh, okay, if I take the rook, so if I move my rook, I get take take. Wow, this is crazy. That's a very decent move. I guess that doesn't even guard my pawn. I'm in trouble. This is bad. This is bad. Only hope I have here is my my ability to open up my opponent's king, which I don't actually believe in because I don't have enough pawns. Like if GH4 gets played here, then I can play like rook G8 maybe or queen H3. Okay. My king is, is safe on the diagonal for now, but queen F5 is pretty terrifying. I don't know what I'm going to play if queen f5 happens. I don't know. Maybe queen d6. I can also take on g3. There it is. Queen f5. Uh, queen d6. I got to block the check. That move should win. That should be enough pawns. But it's a rook. You know, I have a rook, so... Okay. Mm. Gonna create a little bit of counterplay, maybe. Queen e4. Okay, this allows me to play check here, check here. Maybe h3? Now, bishop f3 is met with queen here. This is getting a little scary. Getting a little scary for white, but it still should be fine. So I guess he wants queen e5. Wow. 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 <laughs> Check. Really? E3. I can play like here. Check. King c8. No, that's... I'm, I'm getting blasted if I do that. So... What if I play something like really bold, like king c7? Okay, let me just give a check. I don't have a lot of time. Bishop, yeah, bishop f3 is a serious problem. Because then I will get checkmated, and getting checkmated is probably a bad thing. Wait, I can take the bishop. When did that happen? What? I didn't even see that. I'm not even... I'm not even joking. I didn't even see that. I, I was not, like... I almost didn't see that I could take the bishop. Wow. I t I, guys, I told you. Late night, and by the end of these episodes, I don't have a brain anymore. That was... <sighs> so that means... Okay, we gotta analyze that game. I mean, that was just a... That was a really good... That was a good game. Minus the fact that I just recreationally, you know. Okay, so knight takes f3 was a horrible decision. And uh, it turns out that just going c5 and being solid was just better. It was just better. Um, I'm going to say GG. So, c5, and if en passant, like, knight c6, and holding the center, um, probably around here, I mean, white played very well. Like, I, I, knight f3 was a really bad decision, because I was under the impression that here I was holding. I just, it, it didn't occur to me that, even though it's 3-3, three, three, it's not 3-3 three, three at all, because my queen's first. If my queen's on f6, it's 3-3. Three, three. It's not 3-3. Three, three. So, in my attempt at trying to offset my bad position, I started going for counterplay. And now my opponent made a, made a mistake. My opponent went for the immediate knockout. Um, and uh, that was an error. So, my opponent got hyped that they were, that they were in a better position. Uh, and immediately went for a knockout punch. And essentially, they calculated that if I play AB6, 
Knight e5 threatens mate and the queen. That's what they calculated. But in chess, you must prove yourself wrong and cb6. But still, because my position is so bad, I have to defend. I played the only move. And now Theo sacrificed, that's his name, and uh, got this position, knight e5. And here, it was just torture, basically. I mean, I was just doing nothing. I mean, I was trying to defend, there was some infiltration, I went for some more counterplay. And then, yeah, h5 was a really bad move. I, both of us can learn from this game. Uh, in the opening, there's, a, there's more challenging lines than bishop e6. Uh, bishop e6, bishop g4 is, a, is quite a decent line. Um, knight e7, this line, is also quite decent, just going for e5 right away. I went for a slightly subpar line in the Albin counter gambit, and, I, and he made me pay for it. And I think I might retire from playing bishop e6. I might go back to playing, you know, one of the other lines, knight e7, knight g6, or bishop g4, queen d7, something more active, because my opponent in this game got simply too good of a position. But, hey, listen, there was a lot to learn. It was a fun episode, and if you made it this far, much love for you. Uh, stay safe out there. I got to see my grandparents for the first time in about a year and five months this past weekend, so, and I came back home and wanted to record this episode for y'all because I couldn't record there, didn't have the setup, uh, and uh, that's all for now. You guys know where to find all the other content, course link in the description, use the code if, you, uh, if you're watching early enough, and I will see you in the next video.